Over the past 50 years, probably no one has had more of an influence on street culture than Futura 2000. From co-creating streetwear's first ever t-shirt craze to collaborating with everyone from The Clash, Nego, and Nike. Futura has currently been showing in galleries worldwide, as well as putting in work with Virgil Abloh for both Off-White and Louis Vuitton. My name's Eli Morgan Gessner, and I'm the co-founder of Fat Farm, Zoo York, and a whole bunch of other shit. I'm also the style editor here at Uproxx. So I came up with this show as an excuse to sit down with my friends and the defining figures behind today's creative culture. This is The Masters. My name is Leonard Hilton McGurr, AKA Future 2000, and I'm from New York City. 68, I'm 13. You know, just where you begin to also, you're coming from a period of anti-war protesting. I think before I saw tags on subways and, and stations and random tags on walls in New York, I would see more political messages. So my approach comes from more of like a political, I think, era than anything really, you know, I still attributed graffiti to that. It was a kind of a radical, well, hey, you know, let me express myself this way. That was it, you know, sort of grew up pretty much on the block with the homies, uh, one of which was Mark, of course. Uh, I, I, I knew Mark Edmonds since I guess he was like five. And you know, like I said, I mean, at some point, started to see the writing on the wall and figured out maybe this is something could be interesting to do mm -hmm. just from a, hey, let me participate, you know, like, let me, hey, I exist. I've said before, and it's true, you know, I was inspired by Kubrick's film 2001, A Space Odyssey, so that number was there as a number in my head that I looked at as something, you know, in 1970 that would have been 30 years, almost like not going to live that long feeling about it. You know, whatever it was that drove me to go out there and tag stuff and, you know, ride on trains, it, it happened. The first time going to the yards was locally, you know, uh, in the what we would call the one tunnel uh, on, on the Broadway line. You know, very mischievous and, you know, like you know you're trespassing, you know, you know, you know what you're doing, but it's kind of exciting. So you, you, would, you would meet people who had different affiliations and sort of, you know, had territory and took ownership of those yards, which I think was a cool thing. Like you could be some 15 year old kid, but, but that was your yard or, you know, like sure. you and a few other people c could, could claim that. Pretty outrageous. So in 1974, after a few years of being a New York City graffiti writer, I wind up joining the Navy, and uh, you know, within six months, yeah, I was on an aircraft carrier. You know, the the the, the whole launching and recovering of jet planes on a, on an aircraft carrier, it's just pretty cool. So, yeah, I mean, coming from sneaking around subway yards a few years previously to sitting in the cockpit of an F-14 Tomcat, like on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier off the coast of, I don't know, you know, Thailand or wherever the hell we were in the Pacific, was pretty radical, you know. And the one thing I'll say about my experience, my four years, that time I spent there with access to what we had in terms of technology helped to create me in a sense of, you know, the type of person I am. After the military, I come back, I reconnect with Mark. You know, we're trying to figure out what to do. We had organized a kind of a storefront headquarters. Soul Artist was created in a sense to like, you know, Mark had some very grand ideas about working with the city and getting funding and painting signs for the community. And the people we met up at the Soul Artist studio, because I remember Jean-Michel up there. I remember, you know, that's when we first met Jean was up there. Um, and then, of course, Fred. My name is actually Fred Brathwaite, but all my friends call me Fab Five Freddy. The attempt, I think, for graffiti to go to gallery had already happened a couple of times already in New York. This is now late 70s. This is 79. And it was just in the air again. You know, there was just something in the air, and it was abetted by people like Keith and whoever was all downtown, Glenn O'Brien, this whole downtown thing. And Fred was a real conduit to what that whole thing was, this downtown art, underground New York art movement kind of thing. It is the, the, the door opening, because 
Then New Museum did a show. Then, yes, there's Soho and West Broadway and all the traditional, you know, the Mary Boons and the Leo Castellis of the world. And I guess, you know, the fashion of it all was taking hold. There was a kind of novelty of the whole culture, you know, being exposed yeah. to this, like, white audience. In 1981, The Clash were on tour in, I guess, America, but were in New York for a series of shows at Bonds on, like, 45th and Broadway. So that's when I had met Don Letts. So Don, at the time, was a videographer and a, and a film maker. You know, you got to remember, it's early 80s. Yeah, there's a venue for video, music videos, Wait, but... Wait, but Don Letts shot, like, the Radio Clash video? He must have. Yes. Don's mission in New York was doing a film called Clash on Broadway. Like a complete doc, and they were giving it, you know, two weeks and it wound up being two months. You know, it was one of those kind of experiences for them at that time. And when they immersed themselves into what was then in 1981, the New York City culture and the emergence of hip hop, because at the shows that they did, the opening acts were hip hop acts, like Cold Crush Brothers and Funky Four. I got asked to do a banner that is seen in the Radio Clash video that was forced to be taken down because the union people who run the operation in Times Square were like, you can't go up and hang this thing and, and do that. It's a union, you know, if that's gonna happen, we have to do it. it, it it's great meeting them because ultimately I go on tour with them. Yeah. You know, it's a whole beginning of a great period for me. The popularity it was aided by my relationship with them and you know then I just had a great time with them for the next few years and then they split up and then Don forms up with Mick Jones and BAD and you know the continuation of all that. The time that I connect with Stash at his, at his studio and see what he's doing messing around with like Krylon logos and Rust-Oleum logos he's already setting the groundwork for like Someone who comes from the graffiti culture, it's not even like uh, graphics or anything. You're just repping brands from the culture. These are spray can companies we're very respectful of. You know, and any, any, any writer in his right mind would rock one of these without question. We were selling to random stores, you know, uh, shipping orders, you know, creating, uh, I guess we were printing them locally and somewhere in Brooklyn. The Philly Blunt T-shirt. That was a major item. That started all of it. <laughs> okay, now the biters, the bootleggers, the biters, the thieves. Okay, so basically, you guys came out with an idea. You got the licensing from the company Definitely. and did it on the correct. Too. Did it correct, and you came out with it. And like a lot of artists in music too, there's a lot of bootlegging and bootlegging of music. It's a whole industry, ain't it? Yeah. It's like boom. It's like the tapes, know? the shirts. You know, the hats. No one's safe. And it, you know, we, we weren't ready for the volume. We couldn't control the knockoff craze that was created because of it. And it just got, yeah, it just got too big and then it just kind of swallowed us up. So we had the early 90s of GFS and the Philly Blunt rise and fall and, you know, but then the real continuum was hooking up with Blue and then doing BSF, which is essentially me and Stash like rebooting what we had initially started, but now with the new partner, Blue, we started up um, Project Dragon and we were all like, hey, you know, we kind of need to get these machines and Blue was like, yeah, let's get the max we need. And then it was like really started to have some computing power. And, and then I got really, you know, I, I, got, I got pretty good with, uh, Photoshop and Illustrator initially and just using the machine. We definitely came back with, you know, crisper graphics and, you know, our game was better. And these guys were more even thinking about a retail space, finally, you know, which is how Recon came to be. You know, you have a brand and you have your own shop. I was working with Moax by then. We're meeting the Japanese uh, finally now, you know, our, our 
interaction with them, our introduction to them, I would say happens 96, 97. There was essentially a Moax tour when I first met Nigo. We meet the guys from Harajuku because, you know, the Japanese were always bringing artists out. So it'd be possible to meet artists from the UK and all that kind of stuff like out there. So it was very interesting in a sense that they always seemingly had the budget, the desire, the resources, you know, they could always like make stuff happen and, and meeting artists in Japan seemed frequent. I remember it was weird because I, I think I got like a jacket or something, right? Like they, they, they blessed me with a really nice jacket. And then later in the week when the whole tour returned, like, you know, the crush, shadow. For the big event in Tokyo now at the end that I was part of, it was almost like a rehash of the clash. Like I'm, I'm sort of there, I'm painting, you know, I'm part of a live show in, in, in Tokyo. But I had the ape jacket on. And James is kind of like, oh, oh, hey, what's up? And so now, the cat's out of the bag kind of thing. Like, you can't keep anyone apart. And then, you know, we had our opportunity to work with Nigo, you know, like practically open up, talk about a pop-up store. You know, the concept shop was something that they created. So, you know, he's, he's been there, I, I would say, that's being supportive. Right. You know, if like you're throwing me work or you're getting me work, you know. So, that's, that's good after all this time, you know, has passed and, you know, all of his alliances or whatever, you know, I'm still part of his family in a way, and then that's good, you know. Streetwear brands are everywhere. They've even broken into high fashion, but there's one streetwear brand that has taken over, Supreme. I, the whole thing, I don't know how I feel about it, because, you know, like, well, what can you say? You know, like, you, I guess you have to start with Supreme. Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> and then it's like, yeah, I respect in a way what they've done, because it's like, man, you just went in the whole system and like kind of did uh you know like some renegade takeover i mean i like virgil the whole off-white thing is it it's really a special thing I've been in places in Asia where the whole thing is so extreme from these kids point of view like how they want to rock stuff and be seen with items but I don't know uh, you know from the sneaker from from a, from a sneaker to you know whatever your footwear to your to your cap it just seems like it's a full-on assault right now